Hello everybody, I am Dr. Kathy Malanda from the Department of Surgical Oncology, Vaidhini Cancer Center, Whitefield, Bangalore. And uh, today we have with us here today Dr. Manish Kottapalli, who is an infectious disease specialist from Dallas, Texas. He is also an advisor at our institute. And uh, thank you sir for joining us here today. Uh, today we will be talking about cancer and infections. So sir, to begin with, uh, can you please tell us the interplay between cancer and infection? Well, um, cancer by itself doesn't cause infections unless it's some kind of a cutaneous cancer on the skin. But once you have cancer somewhere deep inside and you start giving chemotherapy and the patient becomes immune suppressed, that's when infections start taking hold of the body pretty much. Okay, and uh, can you also elaborate on what infections can cause cancer? Well, so let's divide the infections into three categories. You have bacterial, you have viral, and you have parasites. So out of these, viruses. This is the main play of cancer causing agents, the viruses. The run of the mill common viruses you see is hepatitis B and hepatitis C. These are the viruses that pretty much cause cancer in the liver. Therefore, um, by preventing them or treating them, we can avoid this one. Um, the second one so commonly you've seen is Epstein-Barr virus. Um, it's called infectious mononucleosis. And these usually cause uh, reactivation in patients with chemotherapy, immune suppression. They can lead to certain tumors. Um, there's another one called cytomegalovirus that again, in patients who are severely immune suppressed, it can cause some tumors, mostly in the brain area. Um, the, uh, there are other uh, viruses like HTLV-1 uh, and all that thing, human T-cell lymphoma virus. They, they actually can cause some uh, cancers uh, in the hematology stem cell areas as well. And then um, in HIV, you get some cancer related ones uh, for uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, Kaposi sarcomas, yes. those kind of things. And then the other one uh, you see is a human papillomavirus. Um, again, this mostly causes cancer in the female genital tract. And uh, again, that can be prevented by giving uh, vaccines. So, so how can these cancers be prevented? Like, uh, well, prevented? Most, most commonly, one thing is there are certain vaccines for certain viruses. For example, there is vaccine for hepatitis B. You can prevent that. Um, three shots, everybody should be taking that if prior to that. The hep C, there is no treatment. I mean, there is no vaccine, but there's treatment for that. If the patient already has hep C, maybe you want to consider treatment for that at the same time or before starting chemotherapy. Now, mono or Epstein-Barr virus, there's no particular treatment for that. Uh, usually, that once you acquire that, it's self-limiting, but it kind of lays dormant and sometimes may reactivate in causing tumors. There's not a whole lot you can do. To... So do you recommend these patients to be followed up? They should be screened before um, doing any of these uh, therapeutic agents that you're planning for cancer. Now the other one is CMV. Again, there's nothing. There's no. Um, there is treatment, but there is no way to give a vaccine for that. Mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Now, when HPV, human papillomavirus, you can avoid, uh, prevent that by giving immunization for girls, especially yes, in the younger age, and boys also. It can happen in both um, genders. So there's are certain things that you can do to avoid. Um, there are certain parasites uh, like strongyloides and cystosomiasis. These are the ones that can cause uh, certain infections, like in the bladder, for example. Uh, those you can actually screen uh, before you start uh, you know, treating these patients. There's another virus called the BK virus that can also do certain damage, but there's not a whole lot you can do for that. But these are rare to be found in this country. But most common things are your hepatonocomial hepatitis and uh, HPV. HPV. Yeah. Uh, so also looking at it the other way around, why are cancer patients more prone to infections? Because of lack of immunity. You know, the cancer uh, therapeutic agents, they kill usually something called rapidly multiplying cells. That's the whole idea behind it. So when they do that, along with the, the innocent bystanders also get killed, the hemopoietic stem cells, the stem cells. The, the cells in your body that produce red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, what have you. At the same time, your uh, lymphocytes, you know, they might also be affected. So depending on, there's, there are certain chemotherapeutic agents that are affecting the lymphopoietic stem cells. Uh, other one is um, affecting the hemopoietic stem cells. So depending on if, if the chemotherapy agent damaging the hemopoietic stem cells, 
your you become anemic, red blood cells go down, your thrombos are depleting, platelets go down, and the worst part is neutropenia. So when you don't have enough white cells, the white cells are the uh, cells in your body that fight against infection. And in your white cell size go down beyond a certain number, you're basically opening up your body for infections. And uh, most common infections you see in these cancer patients is in the GI tract. When I say GI tract, it's going from all the way from the mouth all the way to the rectum. Because it's one big tube. So all this whole tube is lined with the mucous membrane. And the mucous membrane is the one that's protecting it. And the chemotherapy agents can damage the, mu the mucosal membrane. Once the mucosal membrane is damaged, the epithelial cells are exposed. And you know, human body has a lot of bacteria. You have bacteria starting in your mouth, down to the esophagus. Stomach is excluded because of the acid. acid. And then come to the colon, full of bacteria, which is good bacteria. It's there. Uh, it's needed uh, for daily survival, for uh, you know, various vitamin production, so have you. Um, so what happens is now all these bacteria are inside your colon or your mouth or your throat. They're all there, but they are kept in place and there's a mucosal barrier protecting them. When you give chemotherapy, this thing gets damaged. So whatever is there supposed to be inside in a protected like area, it starts entering your system. And that's when the patients become septic. Septic means the bacteria in the blood. So they become septic and some people get uh, bacterial infections, some people get fungal infections. Uh, fungal infections most common is a candida. Candida is usually found in your mouth uh, and also in your colon. Uh, so in the mouth it's very evident, uh, thrush. So any cancer patient who comes in with fevers, the first thing you need to look at is the mouth. Okay. Mandatory examination to see if there's thrush. If there's thrush, you don't need to do any other thing saying that by definition he's immune suppressed. Okay, you know. Then you find out what happened. Why did he get immune suppressed? What are you taking? Then they give you the therapeutic agent. Now, there are certain times when the oncologist can temporarily hold the therapy for until the patient recovers. Or if they cannot hold the therapy, they can simultaneously give you antibiotics or antifungals. Diagnosis. Yes, exactly. These patients are prone to it. So you should learn to look for it and learn to expect it. For example, if you are thinking, okay, this particular chemotherapeutic agent is going to affect the hemopoietic stem cells, then you should be aware that within a few days, the white cell count is going to go down and the oncologist usually preps them up with giving uh, granulation stimulating uh, products like uh, you have mucogen, things like that. Um, so they give a preemptive shock. Sometimes some patients don't get it for whatever reason and their white cell goes down, they come to the hospital, we still have to give a shot to them. But you can prevent these kind of things by expecting that this is what's going to happen with this particular kind of chemotherapy and you do a preemptive strike by pre-treating them with these kind of things. And also you notify the patients that, hey, this agent can do this to you. So if you get ulcers in your mouth, uh, you get that white creamy stuff in your mouth, uh, sudden fevers, don't wait get to us immediately and then on what so those are things you can do and also as an expert how do you advise uh, to manage patients with critical infections in cancer patients well depending on what the infection is um it could be again anywhere from your entire body like most common these things that you get the thrush or uh, dislocating of the bacteria from where they're supposed to be so if the patient is bacteremic you give them antibiotic based on the culture report but then usually which antibiotic do you choose? You just don't choose a regular antibiotic like Saprax1 or something which doesn't have a big coverage for the gut flora. So you want a, a broad spectrum antibiotic um, to start off with that has good aerobic, anaerobic and pseudomonal coverage. And if there is a, a port, like for some patients they have something called Chemo. a mediport, yes. chemoport. And those patients, if they have fevers, you want to preemptively treat them for staph infections as well. So initially you would choose a broad spectrum antibiotic uh, for gut, another uh, antibiotic for gram positive coverage for say vancomycin for your port. And if there's a thrush scene, then you give some diaphragm and wait for the cultures to come back. Within 48 hours, you will know something's going in the yes. blood. And, then and based on that, you can actually take it down. down. And then once the patient's infection is under control, then you can switch into oral antibiotics and Get them out. 
Okay. So you're also the uh, president of Davenport Wound Care Center, and you've set up one of the state-of-the-art uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy units in our uh, Bailey Hospital. So how does this hyperbaric oxygen therapy benefit cancer patients? Well, the only indication, FDA-approved indication for cancer patients right now is uh, radiation injury. Oh. If a patient had some kind of a radiation done and their skin gets damaged and it's not healing properly and ulcer has developed or it has eroded down to the bone, things like that, or chronic osteomyelitis. These are the only indications for hyperbaric therapy and usually you want to first control the infection on the local site. You do the cultures and all that and make sure the patient is not programmed about therapy. And after that, you're putting in the hyperbaric uh, chamber and hyperbaric chamber basically gives you high dose of oxygen under deep pressure. Okay, so that pushes the oxygen into the plasma. Usually the oxygen is carried by the red blood cells yes. in the form of hemoglobin. And the plasma is does not carry oxygen. But when you put a patient under pressure by decreasing the atmospheric pressure in the chamber and you give 100% oxygen, you're forcing the oxygen to dissolve into the plasma, thereby the tissue that is affected by the radiation gets plenty of oxygen. Yeah. So that way, the new generation of the epithelialization happens and they slowly improve better than a patient who did not. Uh, also, so we're now in the midst of the COVID pandemic. So what is your expert advice on patients who have to mandatorily come to the hospital to continue the cancer therapy? Well, if the patient is non-COVID, cancer patient who does not have COVID, standard precautions, wearing regular masks, avoiding sick contacts, isolating themselves from other people so that they remain healthy. And if they still have to come to the hospital for uh, chemotherapy, there's nothing stopping them. They can still wear their protection uh, mask um, and uh, something to cover their eyes, like a shield or just a regular glasses is good enough. And they can come and get their chemo and uh, keep, make sure the cancer sanitizes constantly and continue the treatment. There's and what no, about the vaccinations? There's no contraindication for a vaccine in cancer patients because majority of these vaccines are not viral particle related. These are mRNA vaccines. So there's no virus particles or anything inside that. So there is no restriction for getting a vaccine for cancer patients or immune suppressed patients for that matter. Anybody can get it. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, having this insightful talk with us today. I'm sure it has helped our patients and you've cleared many of our doubts today. You're Thank welcome. You. It's been a pleasure. Thank you again. Okay.